So hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ina Linge and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Exeter where I'm affiliated with a project called Rethinking Sexology. Um, and my talk today, as you can see, is called Narrating Human Animal Sexual Nature around 1920, um, Richard Goldschmidt, Magnus Hirschfeld and Hans Heinz Evers. Um, and I want to begin my talk um, with a uh, quick look at Twitter. Um, so last month, newspapers reported that London Zoo uh, was celebrating Pride Month in honor of its gay penguins, Ronnie and Reggie. Um, by putting up a sign that plays on Stonewall's famous slogan, some people are gay, uh, get over it, saying some penguins are gay, get over it. Now, while we might understand this as part of an initiative of educational uh, institutions to celebrate LGBTQ plus life um, in their archives, exhibits, or indeed um, their non-human residents, um, Others were not so keen on these gay penguins. So this um, self-described um, Catholic uh, journalist, Caroline Farrow, um, saw in Ronnie and Reggie a decadent celebration of personal lives that she wanted uh, to be no part of. Um, and others, such as political activist for transgender rights, Christine Burns, pointed to the work of biologist Duran Roughgarden, who shows that same-sex behavior is far from unusual amongst non-human animals. Caroline Farrow was ridiculed for her um, comments um, that animals do not exhibit human sexuality. Well, yes, they're not human. Um, but her comment does point to two big elephants or maybe two gay penguins in the room. And the first one is, is this really about accepting that some penguins are gay and to get over that? Or is it not very much still about human sexuality and acceptance? And Ms. Farrow's vehement rejection of penguin human sexuality reveals the political potency of, uh, of naturalizing sexuality um, across species. So in my talk today, I want to give you a brief glimpse into how uh, um, early 20th century sexual scientists and sexology adjacent writers constructed, and as I want to show, narrated sexual nature across species boundaries. A narrative is important here because few things require narrative as much as sexuality does. Sexual scientists in the early 20th century may have disagreed on many things. Some explained homosexuality as pathology, others as biologically founded, um, but none of them would have been very happy with the explanation that homosexuality simply is. So in telling these stories of, of um, sexuality, non-human animals become important narrative cues. As Harriet Ridgeville has pointed out, speaking about the animal turn, learned attention to animals is far from new and stretches back at least to Aristotle, but animals have emerged as a more frequent focus of scholarship only during the last several decades. So beyond examining these um, three narratives that sexologists and writers um, constructed about human animal sexual nature, I also want to question the narrative that history of sexuality scholars um, tell about their own discipline by asking, is the history of sexuality a history of human sexuality only? Um, and I also want to point out that this is still a very new project. So in a way, I'm kind of figuring out my own narrative that I tell about my own um, project. So any comments or any recommendations for reading would be very much um, appreciated. Right, so um, my first example is that of Richard Benedikt Goldschmidt. Um, Goldschmidt was a German Jewish um, researcher uh, active in the then new field of genetics. And in the 1910s, he coined the word intersex. Intersex is used today with a different but related meaning as an umbrella term that includes several variations in sex characteristics that do not fit standardized definitions um, of, for, of male or female bodies. For Goldschmidt in the 1910s, intersex included an even broader variation that included, at least as he conceptualized it in the, in the um, late 1910s, homosexuality and explicitly human homosexuality. But his experimental work focused um, not on humans, um, but on butterflies or moths. And Goldschmidt's work was part of a larger scientific effort of biologists to understand the nature of sex. In the early decades of the 20th century, geneticists like Goldschmidt set out to develop theories of the gene to find out what aspects of the sex chromosomes determine sex from one generation to another. Goldschmidt's experimental work of the early 1910s investigated the heredity of sex difference um, using geographically distinct populations of the gypsy moth. Certain combinations of different populations resulted in offspring which were no longer sexually dimorphic and, and displayed intermediate sexual characteristics. Goldschmidt called these individuals intersex. And Goldschmidt hypothesized that intersexuality is caused by dif a difference in what he calls potency. So according to Goldschmidt, each, each organism contains the predispositions for either sex. Within each organism, a quantitative value of the sex factor, its potency, um, and its relation to the potency of the predisposition of the other sex, um, decides which one finally appears. 
And as Sarah Richardson asserts in her book Sex Itself, although um, by the 1930s today's notion of the X and Y as the molecular agents of sex underlying sex dimorphism um, was first recognizable, during, her sh uh, during Goldschmidt's um, early years and the early years of um, genetics, um, leading up to this moment, hormonal and genetic sex determination uh, underneath the appearance of a sex binary was uh, considered um, complex um, and fluid by many. And these scientific discussions of the sex problem were closely embedded in the political, um, social and cultural circumstances of the early 20th century. They were informed by um, and informing broad um, debates about eugenics, feminism and theories um, of race and, the, and, and also the larger social concerns of modernity. So, for example, changing context of, of gender relations um, and sexuality, in particular homosexuality. In 1916, Goldschmidt catapults himself directly into these political discussions by publishing an article in which he argues that his butterfly experiments are of relevance to the study of human intersex, suggesting that homosexuality was one such form um, of intersex in humans. Although Goldschmidt's work hardly ever commented on issues as politically charged as uh, the topic of homosexuality, um, Christopher Kohler argues that Goldschmidt was frustrated with um, sexologists in particular um, who lacked a spe um, specialist knowledge in biological sciences and genetics um, weighing in on the sex question. And Mike Dietrich also argues that Goldschmidt used the experimental nature of his um, research as a means both of claiming greater authority to speak on the science of intersexuality and of differentiating differentiating himself uh, from the sexologist Magnus Hirschfeld, who we'll come to in a minute, um, and others. So for Goldschmidt as a geneticist looking towards butterflies to explain human uh, sexuality is both very mundane and highly uh, controversial. For early geneticists, non-human animals provided an obvious and necessary model organism uh, for discovering issues relating to human sex and sexuality. But to incorporate sexual variation uh, into the basics um, into the basics of genetic function led to controversial and complicated um, conclusions as Goldschmidt's butterfly experiments were co-opted for various uh, political uses. For example, um, Helga Zatzinger has shown that the eugenicist Fritz Lenz used Goldschmidt's work to argue that interracial sexual contact was the cause of degeneration because it supposedly led to the erosion of a clear sex binary. So Goldschmidt's research itself telling a narrative that shows um, how research in the new science of genetics can speak with authority to pressing issues of the day um, lends itself to variously um, politica politicized narratives of sexual nature. Um, which brings me to uh, my second uh, case. Um, so in the second case, I want to focus on, on one such example of how Goldschmidt's research was incorporated into a narrative of sexual nature with political consequences. Goldschmidt's article in which he links butterfly intersexuality to human homosexuality triggered a flurry of responses um, by sexologists. And I'm going to present one example here today, that of um, Magnus Hirschfeld, but if you're interested in finding out more about the other responses, then you can check out my forthcoming article in the History of Human Sciences, where I talk about the other sexologists' responses. So Magnus Hirschfeld was a German-Jewish um, sexologist based in Berlin, who worked as a sexual rights activist, writer, publisher, and practitioner, and was the founder of the first Institute of Sexology. His most well-known scientific contribution to the study of sexology was his theory of sexual intermediacy, which argued that any form of sexual, um, of sexual intermediacy was part of the natural constitution of body and mind, um, rather than acquired through seduction or the result of degeneracy. Sexual intermediates not only included homosexual men and women, um, but all forms of uh, gender and sexual variance as he perceived them, including um, transvestites, which is a term that, term that he coined in, in 1910. When Hirschfeld first opened his Institute of Sexology in 1919, he immediately introduced a butterfly breeding station in order to, and I quote, uh, conduct bastardization experiments and achieve intersex variations through crossbreeding. And this connection between human sexuality um, and butterflies or moths shouldn't really uh, surprise us anymore at this point. Um, Hirschfeld was deeply invested in developing a biologistic model of homosexuality and other forms of uh, sexual intermediacy. Debating sexual diversity with the help of non-human actors reveals a pressing uh, sexological concern for the meaning of nature and naturalness for discussions of gender and sexual diversity. Nonetheless, Hirschfeld's interest in butterflies, and, and Goldschmidt's in particular, was not just guided by a grounding of sexuality in biology rather than pathology, but by a complicated and politicized concern for methodology. 
much as Goldschmidt was concerned with um, presenting genetics as a new science that could stand on its own legs and contribute to pressing issues of the day, um, Hirschfeld was very much concerned with establishing uh, and strengthening the field of sexology. Sexology quickly became influential in the first decades of the 20th century because sexologists came from all walks of life, um, drew on many disciplines and worked with a variety of methodologies. So met medical professionals, um, endocrinologists, activists, eugenicists, lawyers, writers, sex educators, all formed part of the sexological network. Um, but this was also problematic because as a discipline, it lacked a kind of definitive, um, um, definitive um, methodology. And in a talk from 1923, Hirschfeld lists major scientific work on sex in biology, endocrinology, and genetics as having followed in his footsteps. Um, in his list, he mentions Goldschmidt not as a geneticist, but as an experimenter. And later, it's precisely this experimental approach to the study of sexuality that somewhat irks him. And he writes, um, when I drew up the study of sexual intermediate stages, I based this on purely clinical observations by drawing on the broadest possible material, which did not come to me, but which I sought out. Each patient file collected in a consultation, even that of the most prolific psychiatrist, only shows a one-sided view. And as important um, as the findings of artificial breedings of bugs and butterflies may be, which have caused a deserved stir amongst geneticists, by far more value comes from studying the results of breeding, which nature herself has done. So Hirschfeld's um, criticism of Goldschmidt's work on butterflies is that the uh, conditions of his experiment, of, of Goldschmidt's experiments, are um, apparently artificial. So that Goldschmidt uses animals as a as a kind of form of technology. And for Hirschfeld, observing the homosexual at a club um, or bar, or the cross-dresser navigating metropolitan Berlin, uh, which he did, and he wrote a book about this uh, in 1904 called um, Berlin's Third Sex, um, to do so is to observe nature in its natural habitat. Common expectations of what is natural uh, and, and what's artificial are, are really interestingly inverted uh, in this approach, I think. Um, and Goldschmidt's experimental studies, which are uh, artificial, provide useful scholarship to draw on, but these artificial experiments must be advanced through sexological um, observation in nature. So for Hirschfeld, non-human animal sexuality or sexual um, intermediacy supported his argument of the naturalness of homosexuality and other forms of sexual intermediacy. But he, also, he was also wary of the implications of using experimental rather than observational approaches to the study of nature. So this image here um, is taken from one of Hirschfeld's publications, um, and it shows intersex butterflies found on Hasselwerder Island near Lake Tegel in Berlin, uh, where Hirschfeld also lived. Hirschfeld was deeply interested in exploring homosexuality in its natural habitat, and he might have had particular interested a particular interest in local um, intersex butterflies, as these are caught in nature. Comparing lap-bred butterflies to the homosexual population of Berlin could have also been interpreted to imply a sense of breeding and purpose in homosexuality. So strategically, uh, Hirschfeld might have found it more suitable to find butterflies um, in the wild to support his view that homosexuality is naturally occurring um, rather than cultural, a cultural or cultivated phenomenon. Okay, so my final case looks at a very at, at a popular scientific and literary narrative um, of human animal sexual nature, um, and for this example, I'm going to leave the realm of butterflies, um, but we're still in the realm of insects because uh, the final uh, animal in question is uh, an ant. So Hans Heinz Evers was a German writer whose work draws on horror and speculative literature, and tie and he ties these in with um, erotic plots. Um, his work was often deeply interested in scientific advances of the day, from artificial insemination, discussions of heredity, tissue engineering, reproductive technology, and transplant medicine. Evers was known to Hirschfeld. He, support, uh, he supported the gay rights activism of Hirschfeld, uh, and they also published alongside one another. Um, and he was also known to Goldschmidt, whom he met when uh, both were prisoners of war in the US during World War I. Um, and in 1931, Evers joins the NSDAP, the Nazi party. At the same time, Eva's books were censored by the Nazis and his book, books were banned and destroyed uh, in, uh, in public book burnings. In uh, 1925, Eva's published a popular science book on the life of ants called Ameisen or as it's been translated into English, The Ant People. Ameisen combines a popular science study of ants with Eva's usual fantasy and horror writing. 
Now, this might seem at least a little bit weird at first. At least I thought it was quite weird. Um, an account of the names and lives of various ants in the style of a popular science book is interrupted by a series of what Evers calls interludes. Um, uh, and he calls these uh, myrmecomorphic stories, myrmecomorphic interludes, so narratives in which human behavior mimics that of, of, of ants. And as uh, Charlotte Slay um, has shown in her extensive work on the cultural history of myrmecology, myrmecologists and writers often portrayed ants as alien, as different to humans as possible, um, but their skillfulness, independence, intelligence also led to fears that they might attain skills similar to ours. So it turns out actually that ants are perfect, uh, the perfect subject of horror uh, stories. So I'll take you through um, one of these myrmecomorphic narratives, um, a particular interlude focusing on asexual uh, reproduction. Evers begins by, uh, by telling his readers about the reproductive organs of um, the blood red queen, in particular um, her spermatheca, um, a receptacle in which sperm is stored after mating. And this is followed by an imagined inner monologue of an ant who comments on the ridiculousness of human reproduction. Poor girl, the ant thinks. You need a man? Well, and what if there isn't one? Then I can't have children, the human lady admits. The ant has to laugh. She can't imagine anything as ridiculous as someone needing a man to make babies. The blood red queen or redwood ant can store sperm for her entire life. Fertilized eggs result in female worker um, ants, but she can also lay unfertilized eggs, um, which result uh, in males. And this form of virginal reproduction or parthenogenesis, Evers writes, is under-researched in ants and, drumroll, in humans, he claims, um, and tells the following story. In 1921, Lady Bates gives birth to a child born of parthenogenesis, whose true father is, in fact, Sir Norman Bates, her biological brother, who lives thousands of miles away. Sir Bates's friend, Jan, then launches into a hypothetical explanation of this incident. Jan surmises that demons must be responsible for the miraculous conception. A succubus, so a demon taking on female form to deceive and, uh, and seduce human men, visits Sir Bates, collects his semen, and then visits Lady Charlotte in the form of an incubus, uh, a demon in male form who lies upon sleeping women. And Jan makes light of this suggestion by calling it medieval nonsense, but he also continues to argue that these myths and le legends, in fact, predicted recent scientific findings. No one today will deny that many seemingly absurd things which are told in ancient tales, taught in religions, things that science has derided as ridiculous and silly improbabilities, were later found to be true by scientists. This is the case with parthenogenesis. So the legends of succubus and incubus become predictions of new scientific findings. In this case, that, um, as he later goes on to explain, that chemical impulses may trigger parthenogenic um, reproduction. And he's most likely referring to um, the work of Jacques Loeb here, who performed experiments on artificial um, parthenogenesis on sea urchins with the help of chemical stimuli. Tanja Nusser and Ermela Mareikul Fürhoff have argued that Evert's novels make the new tellable by utilizing the, the, the old. So new scientific findings further enable us to tell the stories we already know. But if we return to the framing of this interlude as, uh, as myrmecomorphic and the inner monologue of the ant uh, sniggering at the stupidity of human women, we can see that the story also um, ridicules uh, sexual morality in humans. Because can anyone imagine an ant making such a fuss about parthenogenesis? So like Goldschmidt and biologists of the time, um, Evers shows a concern for the scientific study of ants uh, to highlight similarities between ant and human behavior, um, but he doesn't stop there, both on the level of narrative and, and the level of form. And here scientific descriptions are followed by an interlude, followed by scientific description, followed by an interlude. Um, the move from animal to human goes back and forth between human and ant. These are, uh, these are anthropomorphic and myrmecomorphic stories. They portray a reciprocal relationship between human and non-human animals. If they are like us, are we like them? And if we are, and there is a shared sense of sexual nature, why are some forms of sexual behavior called perverse and unnatural by humans, but perfectly natural by ants? or for ants. Um, and Eva's description of ant life and human life, human prudishness about sexuality appears ridiculous. While Eva certainly supported um, Hirschfeld's idea that homosexuality should not be criminalized, he despised the idea of linking nature to morality at all. In 1924, as he's writing The Ant People, um, Eva writes to Richard Goldschmidt several times, um, sending him a series of humorous ad memoriam poems about ver various myrmecologists, which is particularly macabre seeing as all of them were still alive at the time. Um, and in one of them, he ridicules the myrmecologist and Jesuit priest Erich Wassmann by writing that, um, 
Basman turns every bit of flea poo into proof for God's omnipotence. So Ives rejects this move from nature um, observation to the human realm um, of religion. He doesn't draw conclusions from animal behavior or biology to apply these findings um, to humans. Instead, he says um, that we can already see this behavior in humans. Just like myths have already predicted what science claims to be new, human life already shows a capacity for variations um, on heterosexual reproduction that show a queerness that exceeds the normative expe expectations of natural um, reproduction. So to, um, to conclude very briefly, um, I, I hope to have shown that scientific or pop scientific um, discussions of sex and sexuality um, made extensive use of non-human animal evidence to tell different stories about both how humans and non-human um, animals relate um, and the meaning we can draw from, from so-called natural um, sexual diversity. Like the gay penguins at London Zoo, these narratives are, of course, in many ways about human sexuality. But um, if we agree that, as the Narrative Science Project argues, um, scientists construct and rely upon narratives, and that narrative serves, a narrative serves to order knowledge, then the very ordering of sexuality, so the construction of ideas about sex and sexuality that are foundational to current understandings of sexuality as part of a very identity, um, were developed and sharpened by taking non-human life into consideration. So in this way, I also hope to have um, you know, at least try to show that the history of sexuality is not an entirely um, uh, human history. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your time, and I think we've got time for questions, yeah. Thank you.